Well, we're moving right along in our study of the Civil War. And so today we are going to be on page 183 in your social studies book. So get your book out and read along with me <clears throat> as we talk about uh, some more major battles of the Civil War. Um, some ones of the most famous battles of the Civil War. I bet you might have even heard of Gettysburg, or the Gettysburg Address. And we'll talk about those things today. Um, you know, we, we've been looking at these battles and just seeing tens of thousands of people dying in these battles, uh, both sides, terrible war. And it continues on um, in our lesson today. <clears throat> I'm a bit hoarse today, excuse me. And we're going to keep moving on and uh, uh, find out when this battle is finally going to end, when this war is finally going to end and, and what the result of it's going to be. As we look at the lesson today, uh, we're looking at these questions. What happened at the Battle of Gettysburg? So we're going to look at that battle today. What was the Gettysburg Address? What role did women play? We looked at that yesterday, so we've already answered that question. We won't do that today. How the Civil War end? We're not going to get to that today yet. And we'll get to the other questions. Our two questions we're going to look at today. What happened at the battles of Gettysburg? And what was the Gettysburg Address? So get your book out, page 183. There will be a few questions to go along with this lesson from your book today as an assignment to make sure you listened. So pay attention, okay? The war rages on. Here's a key moment, it says, this caption, the Battle of Gettysburg, a key moment that became known as Pickett's Charge. More than 6,500 Confederates were either killed or wounded. Let's read now. After a major battle for the Confederacy in Chancellorsville, Virginia, the Union slowly began to control the war. Or just get our thoughts together as we're starting again. The Union, that's the United States Army, Confederacies, those Confederate states that seceded. So the Union slowly beginning to control the war. General Lee, remember he's the Confederacy general, wanted to move the fighting from Virginia into a Union state. He decided to lead his army into Pennsylvania. Lee thought if he could win a major battle in the North, many Northerners might stop supporting the war. So we have the Battle of Gettysburg, which is in Pennsylvania. Lee led his men into the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and met a Union army there. For three days, the two armies fought in what became the most deadly battle of the Civil War. On July 4th, 1863, Lee's army retreated back into Virginia. More than 150,000 soldiers fought, and together the Union and Confederacy, this time in this battle, lost nearly 50,000 men. That is unbelievable. Half of 100,000 men, half of Nayland Stadium was, could be filled with the men that died during this battle. The deadly Battle of Gettysburg was a turning point in the war, and after it, the North slowly gained control. Can you imagine one battle, three days, 500,000 dead soldiers? These are all U.S. soldiers. They're all part of the United States. I know the South has seceded, but these are people who should be friends killing each other. 50,000. Man, this just blows my mind. Turn to page 184 with me now. The Gettysburg Address. After the battle... The state of Pennsylvania built a huge cemetery to honor the Union soldiers who had died there. Once it was built, Gettysburg officials planned a ceremony. They invited several speakers to dedicate or bless the new cemetery. President Lincoln agreed to say a few short words. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address began with a quote from the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln said that the United States was founded on the idea that all men are created equal. He spoke of the sacrifice that the soldiers had made. These young men, he said, were testing whether a democratic country like the United States was even possible. He, remi he reminded the audience of the importance of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Finally, he said that no one but the dead soldiers themselves could properly dedicate the cemetery and battlefield. Not many people in the audience that day realized the importance of what they heard. The speech only lasted five minutes, but the next day, northern newspapers printed the speech in dozens of cities. More people were impressed with the moving words. Today, the speech is considered alongside the Declaration of Independence as one of the most important texts in American history. 
Here's Abraham Lincoln giving the speech. Picture of that, drawing of that. Lincoln's voice was a high-pitched tenor, which allowed his words to carry far into the crowds of 15,000 listeners at the dedication ceremony. Why do you think so many people attended? Probably because so many people died there. This was a big deal. 50,000 people died during this battle. Let's look at this little box right here. Union victory at Vicksburg. On the same day as Lee re Lee's retreat from Gettysburg, Union forces led by General Ulysses Grant captured Vicksburg, Mississippi. Now remember, the, Lee and his army, the, when the plans north, the Anaconda plan, they've gone down through Tennessee, taken over New Orleans, and they're coming back up the Mississippi River, trying to take all the cities along the river, and Vicksburg's one of those. Union ships trying to control the Mississippi River had been stuck there for almost a year. After a siege of the city lasting more than a month, General Grant accepted the surrender of the 40,000 Confederate troops guarding the city. With that surrender, the Union gained control of the entire Mississippi River. The Confederacy had been split in two. So the Anaconda plan is working. Uh, they got control of the Mississippi River and all the ports there. And South can't transport anything on the Mississippi River now. The Union controls it. Let's go over here and let's read more about the Gettysburg Address. Here's the whole speech right here. President Abraham Lincoln gave a speech at the Soldiers National Memorial in Gettysburg on November 19th, 1863. Thousands had gathered to honor the dead and hear the president speak. Here's what he said. Four decades and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the idea that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so created and so dedicated can long endure we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It's altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot bless. We cannot respect this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have blessed it far above our poor power to add or take away from it. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they fought here. Well, excuse me. Uh, it is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly pushed for. It's rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly promise that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And that's his speech. And it's considered one of the most powerful speeches ever made. Who does Lincoln say made the ground blessed? I mean, this is a dedication ceremony. So imagine, oh, we'll use this, uh, an example not nearly as serious as this, but a few years ago, I don't know if you remember or not, but in our honors day here at school, they presented Mr. Taylor with a road sign. And the road behind our school is now called Sammy Taylor Drive. After our principal, we dedicated that road to our principal, Mr. Taylor, who's been principal here a long time. So they're dedicating this cemetery here in Gettysburg to those people who had died. Who does Lincoln say made the, the ground blessed? Was it the people that are dedicating it? No, he said it was those people who died there have truly blessed the ground. Now, why does he say it's impossible for anyone else to bless the ground? So he says, we can't do it. We can't do it. The brave men living and dead who struggled here blessed it far above our power. The world, he says the world will not remember for long what they say here, but they'll forever remember the world will forever remember what they did here fighting for the freedom. How does his speech recognize the struggle of the Civil War both then and today? What do you think about that question? How does this speech recognize the struggle of the Civil War both then and today? Well, the struggle, it's obviously dedicating a cemetery. So 
it's a recognition here that a lot of men have died fighting for freedom. A lot of, a lot of people have died in that spot where he's given his speech, fighting for our country to be free. Then today, well, that speech shows that, you know, our government needs to work. We all need to work together for our government to be successful in our democracy, that our government would be by the people, for the people, and of the people. Like was the plan from the beginning that we learned in the Constitution. So those facts that he talked about, all men are created equal, and how our government shall work uh, are both affected them then and it affects us today. That's my thoughts about how that speech affects us then and now. To turn to page 186. <clears throat> so we did talk um, yesterday about some ladies that helped. Um, we spoke specifically yesterday about Dorothy Dix and Clara Barton. And so this gives some other ideas about some things ladies were doing. Some women followed the men to army camps. They cooked, cleaned, and sewed for the soldiers. They nursed the sick and the wounded. So... Here's like an army camp. The men would go out to the battlefields and fight and come back to the camp to eat and wash up. Maybe. Why do you think the women decided to do this? Maybe it was their husbands, right? Maybe they wanted to be with their husbands. They would miss their husbands. Look at these little children here. Think about what they would see at the battles nearby. Life on the home front. The Union's blockade cut off the South's ability to send and receive goods and supplies. Remember, they control the whole Mississippi River. They've got the Anaconda plan going, so the South can't ship anything in. Uh, nothing can be shipped into the South, and nothing can go out of the South. As a result, the Confederate Army began to suffer. But the blockade affected the ordinary people just as much as soldiers. With the men off fighting, most of the work fell to the women. And with no imports and few resources, life on the home front in the Civil War was a battle in its own way. I mean, you couldn't get any groceries at the grocery store because no groceries could be shipped in. So you had to eat whatever you could grow, I guess. Look here at these pictures. What do we see in these pictures? This looks like a bunch of women beating down a bakery door, breaking windows. They're, maybe they're fighting over some bread. There's a little little baby running away with some bread. Here's a lady. Looks like she got knocked down holding some bread. And What about this picture? I don't know what this is showing. Let's read up here. This image appeared in a northern newspaper in 1863. The left side shows southern women encouraging men to go fight the war. The right side imagines a group of southern women fighting for bread from a bakery. So these women are saying, go fight, go fight the north. And these women are fighting for bread because they can't get any shipment of bread in. You know, one of the cool things about the Civil War, I don't know how cool it is, but it's interesting is that we can see pictures from this time. So there were cameras that took pictures back there, back then, photographs. So we see this picture right here of this, this army camp. These are actual soldiers. These were, this picture was taken actually during the Civil War. That's why it looks so old. And here's another picture taken during the Civil War. Here's some wounded soldiers and a nurse tending to them. Hunger on the home front. Living conditions for civilians got far worse as the war dragged on. People were hungry throughout the South because the farmland was ruined. On top of that, there was no money to restore it. Soldiers passing through were hungry and often stole what little food families had. Some women baked biscuits and then hid them inside their hoop skirts so soldiers couldn't find them. Salt was also difficult to find. It was also very important for preserving food and cooking. Some families dug up the earth underneath the floors of their smokehouses to gather salt that had fallen between the cracks. They poured water over the soil and then boiled it to separate the salt from the dirt. Isn't that sad? Think about how difficult it was to be living back then and all the trouble the South was going through. Some of them starving to death, just boiling dirt to get the dirt out. And so the salt, they could have the salt from it so they could cure their meat and make it last longer. Hiding biscuits in their dresses so the soldiers wouldn't steal them. I mean, this was sad times in the South, hard times. But that was the anaconda plan to squeeze them and squeeze them and squeeze them until they just couldn't stand it anymore. Caring for the wounded. After male doctors and nurses treated the soldiers on the battlefield, women became the main caregivers for the sick and the wounded. Women tore tablecloths and sheets into strips for bandages and turned their homes into hospitals. Some women made regular trips to the front, carrying boxes of food, clothing, and medical supplies to the soldiers. 
Look here. This quote from a Confederate nurse from Tennessee on January 3rd, excuse me, 1863. The wounded kept coming in last night till 12 o'clock. Every corner of the hospital is filled and the attendants had to give up their beds for them. Our cooks have been up for two or three nights. The surgeons and nurses the same. So terrible times. Every bed in the hospital is filled and they are trying to take care of these soldiers. The cooks are cooking for them. They've been up for two or three nights in a row. In this famous photograph here, Ann Bell cares for two Union soldiers in Nashville. Nurses played an important role in how the war affected people at home since they told family and friends about the awful wounds they saw. Well, um, yes, like I said, yesterday we looked some more specifically at two nurses that were very, grew very famous during the Civil War. This was a sad lesson, wasn't it? To think about 50,000 people dying, to think about people in the South starving to death, having to hide biscuits and boil dirt to try to get some salt. It's kind of a sad lesson, but really this whole time, this whole period of our country was probably one of the saddest times in our country's history. And so we're going to keep learning more about it, keep studying more about it. I want you to um, I'll go now and take uh, the little quiz on this lesson. There's just five questions, okay? And I want you to take that quiz and make use your book. Um, page We were on pages so 183 to 187. So use your book to answer the questions. You should make a 100. All right. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you tomorrow.